development, which might otherwise trigger a consideration in terms of very special circumstances. And you can see how the three levels of planning appeals, inquiry being the most involved, hearing, written representations, that roughly 90 to 95% of the decisions are written representations. About one third of those appeals are allowed, one third. If you think at the blunt level, planning appeals are about a yes or a no, that would suggest there's two options there, which is a 50-50. <coughs> Take into account all those planning appeals, only about one third are allowed. And that doesn't specify major development, which for residential is more than 10 houses. Well, 10 or more, I forget the exact detail. So anyway, going forward, in terms of very special circumstances, we have planning appeal inquiries, the most involved procedure for planning appeals. And the planning inspector implement, some will know Bridget Rosewell, implemented a number of her recommendations and looked to be clear in terms of the process for planning appeals. And this is relevant for appeals where very special circumstances on, on greenbelt land are involved, but also it's meant that the timeliness of decisions by the planning inspectorate is more weighted towards the uh, Rosewell procedure for planning appeal inquiries. They're quicker, in other words, tend to be more involved tend to be led by legal advocates and what have you, but we are finding that hearings are suffering by having a longer period of time to get through to determinations. Now, my own view is when it comes to progressing an appeal on Greenbelt land, having to demonstrate very special circumstances, we'll come on to what some of those might be. It is a higher bar, it is a greater challenge to demonstrate very special circumstances on appeal than it is to uh, achieve exceptional circumstances through a local plan. And ultimately, the planning balance is about harm, benefits, and weight. And we know that the government policy says to decision makers that when it comes to new development in the green belt, it is inappropriate, it will be harmful, and it should be refused unless there are very special circumstances. So some of these circumstances, and they do vary, and I won't read out all these bullet points, but it depends upon, for example, has the local authority as a potential decision maker, won't be if they go to appeal, but have they already identified the site to come out of the Greenbelt for Development? Yes or no. If they haven't already identified it to come out of the Greenbelt for Development, have they acknowledged that their growth requirements require a review of the Greenbelt? Is the site itself previously developed land, even just in part? Is the site visually well contained? Is the local plan policy out of date? Is the proposed development capable of facilitating benefit beyond residential? This is talking about residential in particular. And will it meet housing need? And it's such a fundamental requirement. But meeting housing need is not in its own right sufficient to outweigh the harm to the green belt. It's not sufficient in its own right. And we even go back to, I think it was December 2015, Brandon Lewis MP at the time was the housing secretary. I believe it might now be Northern Ireland secretary, but anyway, he issued a written ministerial statement to say that meeting housing need in its own right is insufficient to outweigh the harm to Greenbelt through planning appeals. Before we go on to just, and we'll wrap up, this is the last slide. Before we go on to, there are a number of planning appeal decisions which have come through on Greenbelt land. And the first point really is, has it been judged by the decision maker that the proposed development is inappropriate, so therefore it's materially larger if there is development already on the site, and therefore puts it in the category of very special circumstances. Two examples, and there are two which I'll just pick on. One which is relatively recent, so the end of January this year, former Brokehill Golf Course Seven Oaks, up to 800 dwellings, went through to appeal, planning inspector determination. It included more than 800 dwellings. It included self-build, retirement, primary school, it included employment land. It included land for car parking for the train station, had a train station nearby. I don't know the site, but I can read what the appeal decision is. We can all read what that appeal decision is. But there it was considered that despite all those potential wider benefits beyond housing, it was inappropriate. They hadn't outweighed the harm to the green belt. And that planning appeal was dismissed, meaning planning permission was refused. That was the 31st of January this year. Take another example. Roundhouse Farm, Colney Heath, 
which straddles between St Albans City and District and Welland Hatfield Borough, I believe it is. Again, not a site I know particularly, but we can read the appeal decisions. There we had up to 100 dwellings, which didn't have the wider community non-residential development benefit to it, but that one went through, it was allowed. Now, it's almost impossible to draw comparables between different planning appeals. And that's where we say, when it comes to planning appeal, yes or no, black or red, roulette, are you gonna get the appeal decision? But ultimately to demonstrate that you're outweighing the harm to the green belt through very special circumstances is a very challenging. So that's where you almost say you can forget it in terms of the prospects going forward. Just briefly then to wrap up in terms of the future, we've got changes of planning system, which we talked about. I personally don't see a trend towards um, reducing the policy weight which is given to protection of the green belt. And actually, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, you know, the system needs to protect the green belt in a number of locations and what have you, and therefore we need to just work with it. There are growth targets and we will see whether when it comes to residential development in particular, the standard method for calculating housing requirements, will that change? It became quite toxic at the back of the 2020 and it's a target for a lot of criticism. Local elections will come and go. Who knows if we'll have a general election next year? We'll have to see. Climate change is so important when it comes to the pattern of land use and development in our country. We've talked about high streets, town centres. We've talked about alternative uh, patterns for more sustainable transportation, which is highly relevant. There's often an argument made, which is to say, if you review the green belt and you have development on the edge of a settlement on that green belt land, it's going to be more sustainable because you can plug into where you've already got built development whether there's a school there, community centre, high street, whether there's a tube station, whether there's a bus interchange or what have you. So it's often used to say it's more sustainable. It isn't necessarily always more sustainable, of course. You know, it does depend upon what we're looking at. And then biodiversity net gain. I appreciate this is about green belts and appeals and what have you, but I'm seeing, and no doubt some of you are as well, it's increasingly relevant for the decision maker in the planning system, both who decides when it comes to plan making and decision making? Biodiversity net gain. We've got the potential, we've got the current consultation of the 5th of April, I believe it is, by DEFRA regarding biodiversity net gain through development. Those who haven't seen it, please do have a look at it, consider whether you want to respond. It's so important for future generations. And we've got the prospect coming in of November next year, a minimum mandatory requirement, 10% biodiversity net gain from development going forward. And that is relevant for the status of some land which is in the Green Belt. So to sum up then, I firstly appreciate you all listening to me. I would say when it comes to the prospect for appeals through very special services in the Green Belt land, you can almost forget it. You know, you should really be looking at taking it through the plan making system, through exceptional circumstances and do it that way. But some get through, the majority don't. Thank you all very much indeed. Any immediate questions for David? Yes. Sorry, I've got a quick one. So in L London especially, um, there was this recommendation in the London plan that there was a strategic review of the Greenbelt, which was then the mayor of the mayor didn't listen to um planning inspectorate, and then the Secretary of State didn't tell the mayor to listen to the planning inspectorate. And like I said, they indicated then let's pick on industrial land instead. If you have to go through We've talked, we've talked a lot about strategic planning in this conference, but when the key strategic document for London, because of politics, doesn't address a, a, a fundamental issue, which is that uh, London's land supply is severely constrained, how, I mean, how do you not go through the appeal process if, if, you, if it's so hard to strategically, you know, promote Greenbelt sites in London? Uh, of course, it does come down to what the status of the land is, so whether it's partly previously developed, whether it's already been identified in a housing land availability or an employment land availability, you know, for, for it to come forward. So that is relevant. Um, I would say, though, if, if it is greenbelt land, whether it's in London or, you know, outside the metropolitan greenbelt, to have a planning strategy, which is, yes, to take it through plan making, but if there isn't the plan coming forward to review the greenbelt to take it a planning appeal, it's a very high risk, very costly, strategy and there are some planning appeals which can kill off 
a site for prospects for development. Quite rare, but literally in terms of a planning inspector and or the Secretary of State's determination, it could kill off the site by just simply saying, well, this is the wrong thing, this is the wrong site. So I agree it is frustrating and of course exceptional circumstances if you're promoting one bit of land to come out the green belt, you're not in control of that because you're not the plan making authority, Often the local authority, whoever that might be is a plan making authority. And of course we all know there are land agreements, there are contractual obligations in the real world of commercial land considerations, which may not have the length of time to allow you to spend promoting it for three, four, five years. Horses for courses, very frustrating it can be at times, but it'd be very challenging to take it through to a Thanks, Can I ask, if the local authority were to set conditions in urban extensions around a city like Oxford, which required not only a mix uh, contribution to social housing, but also financial contributions to improving the transport system. First of all, to what extent would those be considered special circumstances? And secondly, would that then set the price for the land such that the land owner could not argue that the land was worth uh, housing value uh, uh, because it all depended on complying with the conditions? Or does that require a legislation in order to achieve what I've just uh, suggested? Yeah, so, so on the first point, if the decision makers, and let's say we're in a two-tier authority, and you, you referred to the city of Oxford, and obviously you've got the wider Oxfordshire area, I'm, I'm based in our Oxford office, as it happens. There, as with Cambridge, they have a track record of reviewing the green belt and bringing forward land out of the green belt for sustainable urban extensions, not just residential and what have you. And it can be a case that by contributing towards, let's say, sustainable transport measures, that could be a very special circumstance. But I would tend to say that the local authorities, whether you're the local planning authority and or the local highway authority, would tend to say, let's do this strategically. Let's take it through the plan making process. It isn't the case that necessarily it's a correct thing to do to generate planning obligations whether that's works and or financial contributions off the back of one site, as large as it might be. So I'm assuming this is linked to, say, the spatial growth plan that Oxfordshire is uh, supposed to be introducing, and that you could imagine that it might be linked to uh, drawing up codes for all these sites and so on. I, I, and I say this was to give evidence to the scrutiny committee at Oxford City next month. Um, uh, and I want to be able to say, that we can, through the planning system, achieve much more control than we do over the uses and also the values if local authorities are proactive. Okay, they may have to put invest in it and there may be an appeal, but if the, can I assure them, the local authority would have a reasonable chance of winning the appeal in terms of that the value won't shoot up just because there's a hypothetical possibility of land going for housing in the green belt. I mean, what I, what I would say is that really that should be for the plan making process. We, sh we shouldn't, and I do understand why the question is phrased that way, but we shouldn't even be talking about a planning appeal. This should be about the plan making process to take forward a strategically identification of what the growth requirements are, and therefore the spatial element of where the growth requirements yeah. are, where the sites can come yeah. forward. So really in that context, and there, there are the good examples that say Oxford and Cambridge, we are working as others are on the edge of Oxford city sites, which go into South Oxfordshire district, we're going, going to Cheerwell district. There we've got the allocations in place, you know, very detailed policies, forgive me if you're familiar with them, which then lead to design coding and master planning and what have you. But ultimately, I mean, your second question, I'm probably not the best place to be answering, but I will attempt to anyway. When it comes to value, it's not, of course, planning obligations about capturing value. The government might want to take us there by a strategic infrastructure tariff. They might want to take us there. Currently, though, it's mitigating impact. And really, I would say, given the huge imbalance between supply and demand for land, for development on the edges of Oxford, Cambridge and, and London, the huge imbalance that you're always going to have significant land value increases by taking land successfully through the planning system. And it should never be the case that mitigating impact from development through planning obligations mean to say that the landowner can say it's not viable or it won't work that way or what have you. It can all be factored in 
and the majority if there's developers promoters in the room the majority of developer promoters would love to get that deductible from land value so the huge increase in land base land value cost from not having a planning permission and not having an allocation to getting that in two three four years whatever it is it's that land value which should then be put towards mitigating the impact of the development it's 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 more complex than that but that's a simple type model i would say but i'll just finish off to say really it, this should be about the plan making process and taking it through collaboratively at a strategic level and not thinking i can't wait for Cherwell district council or south cambridgeshire district council to make a plan so i'm going to put in a planning application and we go forward to appeal and try and will it win it on very special circumstances no i think i i my what i take from what david is saying is that the it's a gamble to go to appeal on a greenbelt site and uh, and the odds are not good and the costs are very high uh but if you actually look at results on the outcomes of new plans there's a surprising amount of green belt land released in local plans and promoting your site through the local plan process, I think you're saying, has got much better odds attached. It's just a different process and it's less, uh, a, a less a conflict involved, it's more constructive. Uh, but you've got to start with the right piece of land, I guess. David, thank you. Um, Paul, we're well, happy to introduce yeah, your panel. I will. Can I ask Tamsin, Rieta, Janice, Sanmi to come and sit in the comfortable looking chairs at the front? Um, this is a kind of question and answer session. We'll try and make it fast and furious. And I suggest that we actually Curtail it, uh, Brian. We'll pick up an appropriate moment so that we don't see six o'clock vanishing. I can hear wine bottles. That's yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, welcome to um, Tamsin uh, Renshaw, the Development Director of Pocket Living, ex Grosvenor. Uh, Professor Janice Morfitt, you've heard from excellent presentation earlier. Uh, Sammy Adigoki, we're very relieved to, hit, to see him here because he was in Lagos yesterday and got an overnight flight just to be uh, at Brian's event. Um, and his company, Rearbuff Property International, uh, works in the UK and in uh, Nigeria on uh, kind of retrofit and improvement projects of, of, of various sorts. And finally, Dr. Rieta uh, Oosthuizen is Head of Planning at HEA, HTA Design. Um, let's run it along the line just with maybe a couple of comments of things that have struck you from what's been said um, this afternoon or, or thoughts that you may have uh, on the uh, levelling up white paper and uh, let's start with you, Greta. Um, I suppose what, what I would say is, is what I work on on a day-to-day -day basis and that's more to do with housing and design and um, and particularly design codes, um, which from what we now know, the running white paper is, is binned, um, but it, it sounds like design coding might stay. Um, now, Robert um, Adam had an interesting point that design coding actually determines value. Um, I actually think it's a much more uh, iterative process um, and you can't actually set a design code for areas, particularly outside London, without understanding viability in the case for development in the first instance. Um, I think to make design codes work well, um, we do need to look at resources. Uh, Roy showed us how under-resourced local authorities are. To do a proper design code, a good design code, you need to be able to be a good client. You need to understand the development process. You need to understand that. Um, design and you need to understand planning in three dimensions. Um, Joanna talked about the importance of master planning. I actually think if we look at much more streamlined local plans, these plans need to be three dimensional. But unfortunately, I think the knowledge that we have to have, the knowledge that local authorities, Janice's work, they are incredibly important in terms of how they can contribute to housing delivery, but they need to be adequately resourced. Um, and um, we cannot let developers lead that process actually partly funding local authorities on its own, because I don't think then we will end up with quality development. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Sammy, any thoughts from, from a, an active and live developer? I think I would uh, speak on my voice, sorry. <clears throat> I'll probably speak on the same thing as she said about the, the level of resources on the council, which is key for a lot of the delivery of a lot of the stuff. Because we currently have four major planning application and we know part of the problems about and the challenges is the councils are let the resources. They don't have a, the staff to see that in terms of a delivery for the it's just not working. And if we're talking about living up our people and we're not funding this resource, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> Better. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the key thing for me is just saying that it's more about the resources. Most of the councils I've seen over the years that it's the same planning officers on the same application. It takes a longer period, a longer process to get your planning shoot. And you can see that the local authority, the funding process, they're not funded as much as they should be. So if we don't have a, a way where uh, from the central government, there's a way where we can see the resources are pulled towards that, it wouldn't help us as developers to see that this white paper can be delivered. Another thing I also will say is delivery is key. A lot of this thing we say over time is there's so many things. Are we working on the implementation of the delivery? How do we see, what are the timelines to see that this can be executed? You can have the new secretary of state being changed over a period of time and the delivery that affect that. So if we're gonna to have to do this, what are, the, what are the efforts that they're gonna be putting in place to police this? to see that this can be effective. And I think the other one I'll probably say that I'm a big fan on is digital innovation. Uh, we kind of see that now around the world, digital technology is key for a lot of stuff. Prop tech, we can see so many things coming up in that space. And if we want to see this white paper being delivered, there should be a lot of funding into digital innovations. Thank you very much for that. Um, Janice Morford, I've got a question for you arising from um, your presentation and also some of the statistics we saw about the cutting of, of funding for, for planning. I mean, the curiosity is that in living memory, nobody paid planning fees with applications. Uh, now they do. Uh, no one's seen their council taxes going down um, in the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, what is going on here? Why, why is it seems as though planning departments are almost being picked on but who is it that's picking on them it's not really the government is it is it local authorities making those decisions themselves you you've you've been on both sides of the tracks on this um i think well you can look at the national audit office study to give some indication of um, results and they've looked at 2018 2020 and i think it's i think planners and highway engineers we also saw them being cut um, it's, it's the effect of residualization. So you can't cut social care, you don't really want to cut, you can't cut um, housing, temporary accommodation. And so you just, and libraries, youth services, um, all of these other things have already gone into you know, alternative forms of provision if they're still there. So it's really all that's left to cut. And, and I think that's why, but when you look at the motivations of why councils are um, get moving into direct delivery of housing. And we've looked at motivations from 2017, 19 and 2021. When we looked at 2017, um, the highest motivation was that councils were moving into housing delivery in order to generate income to support other services. Um, and I think that um, by the time we get to 2021 though, um, that's been replaced by two other priorities. The first one is to meet housing need. And that's across all types of councils, across a whole country, all political control. Um, and um, so we are, uh, and the second issue that's come shooting up is that councils are getting involved in delivery because they are completely appalled by the standard of design being offered by the private sector. And they actually want to do themselves design compliant um, development to show um, private developers that they can actually build in compliance and make money um, and the local where these are offered um, in local housing markets then there is a preference to purchase houses provided by the council 
in comparison with those provided by the private sector. So thank you very much. Well, talking about levelling up and housing, I mean, pocket living, literally uh, levelling up, very nice, slim residential block down at Wandsworth, which I frequently, uh, frequently pass. Um, from the point of view of somebody who's in the housing provision business for people who are certainly not wealthy, um, how do you view the, the levelling up agenda and what's sort of coming down the line in planning terms? Well, I mean, it, we can't, I suppose I come at it from a, a perspective of being London based and also delivering intermediate housing for first time buyers. Um, and I think one of the key things is that you know, we need to think about levelling up across the board. It's not just a, about geographical levelling up. There's a real problem, particularly in London, about generational, le intergenerational levelling up. And, you know, there are whole sort of generations of people who are frankly very privileged in London who, in, who do actually, interestingly enough, engage very much with the planning system and generations below that who don't really engage. They don't really know that they ought to. Um, and they get really, you know, they're essentially priced out of the housing market and that's incredibly acute in London and I, I think what's quite interesting is that the solution being put forward for that is first homes which some of you may be familiar with is is actually similar to what we do we, we do a 20% discounted home and of course we, we know through experience that that is deliverable I mean, I would throw actually a question out to the floor to ask people, does anybody know of any first homes coming through in London at a 30% discount or more? Because I'm not aware of any, and I've been asking over the last year or so, everybody I know, whether it's in local authority, um, private developers or planners, but does anybody here know of any? I mean, Anyone that kind of that answers to... the question, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, 20% really, is it's like a cap. Little. It's, it's around what's deliverable. And I think one of the concerns that I have is that the subsidy that will be required to deliver a 30 or more discount will actually, through viability assessments, et cetera, erode the delivery of social housing, which is something I'm also equally passionate about because I have a board role um, with Broadway Living, which is Ealing Council subsidiary RP. So I'm involved in council housing delivery as well as intermediate homes. Um, and it's... It's a, it is a real problem trying to sort of plug this leaky ship of, of, of right to buy. And it's actually even mentioned in the levelling up paper that I think it's mentioned in a positive sense that over 5 million households were in social housing before. Now it's 4 million because of the success of right to buy. But that tells you that actually what's happened is that the housing stock is eroding at a rate that can't be replaced. And that's one of the main drivers in London, I think, um, for councils delivering their own housing is trying to plug that leaky ship. Well, I want to go back to Riester on this because um, HTA have kind of led the charge in suggesting how density, uh, especially in suburb suburban contexts, can, um, via excellent design, create a situation where you can provide transformational housing at scale. And I suppose my question to you is whether the world of design and coding and all the arguments that can go on about that and the requirement for a good client and the sympathetic planning authority. Is this actually simply a whole series of breaks on building homes? Or do you think that actually it's essential and you'll get there in the end? Well, I think what is interesting about the idea of leveling up and what we now know that Michael Gove really likes the policy exchange paper on street votes. So you're going to start looking at street-based intensification. And of course, if we look at the work that HDA have done, where we've identified a number of stations um, in the outer ring of London that are actually not close to high streets, but where the average density is 25 dwellings per hectare, which is not a sustainable density. Um, and there is great what we call the place potential to intensify those. So that is there. But if we start thinking about leveling up and the idea of, of um, narrowing the gap, then I think anything, any idea um, like street votes um, shouldn't just be um, in the hands of those with capital. I think we need new um, bodies that could, new development bodies that could actually assist um, the left behind neighborhoods to actually look at very local intervention. Um, and then the other thing that I would just like to 
add to that um, is that, of course, design coding, this, uh, what bothers me is what, what Robert had on his slide as well, provingly popular. Um, if we are looking at a future where we definitely need to address climate change, then single issues what people might find beautiful might not always be the best thing to deliver and it's actually to balance that and that's where the role of planners should be um, and planners are largely paralyzed by politicians and and we can't allow that to happen thank you and sammy i mean developers by definition everything you do is about the future and i wonder whether the sort of emphasis on consultation and discussion and local communities telling you what's the appropriate design, whether you think, well, this is a great opportunity because they'll love what I do, or whether you think, actually, I'm just going to have a whole set of new hurdles that I've got to negotiate, quite apart from dealing with the, with, with the planning authority. I think for me, what one thing we normally do is we, we do a lot of consultation with the community to see that wherever the design we're bringing into that community is fit for purpose for that community. A good example is something we just recently done in Datford, which is to be a police station and a cult, a former police station, a Manchester court, and we developed, we turned that into a co-living and a co-working space. And that was the first of its kind in Datford. We had a long consultation to see that the local uh, community were receptive to that, and they were very open to supporting the application. And even the council, we had a planning within, that was the fastest planning decision in Datford. Within three weeks, we had a planning decision because they were receptive to the idea. So I'm a firm believer that that is important for you to do so that that can also aid your planning as well. Thank you very much. Jess, I want to switch now because we haven't talked much about the North yet. The whole levelling up programme is very much a kind of, I don't know, it's the legacy of the, the Northern powerhouse, which started to get off the ground and then it seemed to stall. Um, do you see the sort of political and planning debate in relation to the North of England as a different debate or is it actually not so different to what's going on in Oxford or Deptford or Kent or wherever? Um, I think each, each local authority, each part of the country has its own legacy and its own issues to face. So, um, and I think in the North, as I said earlier, there are issues about the private sector not building um, um, sort of man homes for managers because they didn't think there was a market for them and, and then people leaving. Um, I talked about the graduates as well. But of course, if you're reliant on say section 106 or SIL to produce some social housing or affordable housing, then the viability probably isn't there in the North. So I think, you know, we should, I personally feel that we need to move away from thinking of developers directly funding social affordable housing through section 106 and go back to um, using traditional taxation and then giving local authorities these five-year programs or, you know, the 32 billion that's in Homes England, um, why don't we use some of that? Um, you know, it's a lot of money and we, we could actually be, you know, if, if every local authority in London with all the land problems can start building homes, um, and that's across all political parties, then you know, why do we think this wouldn't work elsewhere? Um, and I think um, in other parts of England, certainly councils are just doing it for themselves. They've just got fed up with the government waiting. And while the government have been distracted with Brexit and then COVID, and if, in fact, if you look at the capital, uh, expenditure in local government um, in this last two years. It's been the highest ever. So this is where councils are choosing to raise funds. And if you look at those councils with a housing revenue account, again, spread across the country, but the um, increase in rents and rising values will mean that those programmes can increase quite rapidly to 2030. So, so we're seeing a lot of potential. And I think um, there's an issue about e economic growth and investment, but housing issues are probably similar, if not quite the same everywhere. Thank you very much. And a, fine, a final comment, bring this session to a close, I think it's been short and sharp. Um, so any final thoughts about the relationship between um, the apparently increasing complexity and demands being put on um, planning applicants 
now you've got to do net biodiversity. You know, you can't go near anything with a blade of grass on. It's, you've got to do retrofit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is it actually becoming more and more difficult at a time when government is saying, well, we need things more and more and more, but actually they're just putting up increasing barriers. Do you get a sense of this or, or is that too, too pessimistic a view? Um, I mean, it is, it is becoming more complicated, that's for sure. You know, there are increasing requirements placed on developers. And on the larger schemes, that is surmountable and that's understandable. The problem is when you actually find as an applicant, if you're putting in an application for 35 homes and you have exactly the same hoops you need to go through, predominantly compared to one that's for over 400, and I've had that in my team over the last year, that, that, that doesn't make sense. It's, it's not proportionate. And so you as a, it, it just puts off those infill, infill sites from coming forward. And that's actually when you aggregate them across, uh, across cities, you know, they're the best sites to bring forward, but they're really not that sort of appealing as a developer often because you have to invest a lot of money, a lot of resource. You often don't have quite as much political support because obviously 400 homes, people can get behind more than 35. And so they're just a lot harder to make happen. And so I, the, my one sort of ask would be to try and make the system a bit more proportionate. I'm not entirely sure how you'd do that, but um, if it could be done, I think that would be a bit of a magic wand. Well, it's a kind of positive note to end on. Panelists, thank you very much indeed. Back to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we're going to hear from Paul again. He's a good Selwyn man, so he's, uh, he's the right man in the right place. Um, I'm just going to, we're going to finish having dwelled on questions about the north of England. Um, we're going to come firmly back to London with Rob McNichol. Rob, would you come to join us? There you are. Um, he's, uh, Rob is acting London plan team manager. All of you seem to be acting at the moment, including your boss. Well, right? hopefully we're acting very well. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope so. Uh, from the GLA, and just a, a, going to give us a rundown on what I call the new, but he says, no, it's the London plan. Thank you. If this works. <coughs> That's if you press the right bit. Yes, that's always a challenge. Uh -huh. Great, so great to be here. Um, and yeah, it was a year ago uh, this month that the mayor adopted the London plan. Of course, for celebration in the London plan team, I think we had an extra special Zoom quiz that <laughs> evening. Um, um, to, to look back last year uh, at March, we were a year into a global pandemic uh, that were playing untold havoc with the way our city functions. March 2021 was 10 months after the first funding package that was agreed between TfL and the government. Long-term funding for TfL remains unresolved. It was six months after the publication of the planning white paper, and it was three years and nine months after the disastrous fire at Grenfell Tower that exposed the dire state of our country's fire safety system. More well, positively perhaps, uh, but no less of a challenge, March 2021 was 14 months after the mayor committed to making London uh, net zero by 2030. And all of these things pose major challenges for the planning system. So what I want to say a little bit about today is how we in GLA planning are navigating these uncertain waters while trying to secure the mayor's vision for good growth. So a quick reminder of some of the key figures from the London plan, we aim to build 52,000 new homes every year in London. We want half of them to be genuinely affordable. We want all major development to be net zero carbon. We want 80% of trips to be sustainable by 2041. And having an adopted London plan with clear targets gives us all in the planning world a direction of travel. And uh, I mentioned COVID-19 earlier, we can't escape it at the moment. Uh, and while the plan was developed before the onset of the pandemic, there are various parts of the plan that will help London's recovery, whether that's policies that support the central activity zone, the heart of London, 
uh, or requirements for play space in new development, for development to improve air quality and standards for outdoor amenity space, all things that will help to get people into the best ventilated places that is outdoors. But we know we also have to tackle some other major challenges. And there are a broad range of policies in the plan that are gonna help address London's housing crisis and help to tackle the climate emergency. Now, GLA planning and the whole of the GLA are doing an awful lot of different things to help implement the London plan and the other mayor's strategies. But I just wanna focus on what we in the London plan team are doing at the moment. Our core activity is writing and engaging on London plan guidance. This is our current program. Uh, and as you can see, it's an extensive list of topics. Some of them are fairly new ideas, I guess ones introduced in the London plan, like the Public London Charter, uh, and we adopted that last year. And then there are some other issues that have been around for some time. Housing design standards have been something that I think the London plan uh, and the GLA have been championing for many years now. A quick run through then of what we've currently got out for public consultation. First up, four pieces of guidance that deal with design and characterization. These are separate bits of guidance, but they inform each other. We've got characterization and growth strategy guidance, which is aimed at boroughs as they develop uh, local plans, helping them to understand the vision for their area, uh, work with local communities in collaboration. Um, and it also gives some guidance on how to develop tall buildings policies in the local plan, which is a key issue, I think, at the moment. Uh, whilst I'm mentioning tall buildings policy, I think I'd also like to flag the new advice note that Historic England published a couple of days ago um, on the same subject. So worth picking that up if you've not seen it already. The guidance sets out how that characterization work can then be used to inform design coding for small sites, and that picks up on the National Model Design Code and National Model Design Guide. Uh, and we've been working with government on that as well. Um, and it also feeds into how uh, boroughs can help to identify the capacity for larger sites. And that's something that can also be used for designing developments as well as the plan making stage. The housing design standards, London Plan Guidance sits a bit separately to all of this. We've designed it quite deliberately as a sort of one-stop shop that will help designers and architects and developers as they develop new schemes uh, to make sure that they're responding to all the various requirements of the London Plan. This guidance expands, uh, sorry, next slide. Um, we've also launched uh, fire safety London plan guidance, a really important area at the moment. Uh, and this guidance expands in quite a lot of detail on the requirements of policy D13 of the London plan. It sets out uh, what's required for fire statements to accompany major development. And it sets out who should write those statements and the appropriate qualifications they should have. It gives information on what should be submitted on outlines and on um, the detailed reserve matters. And it includes, amongst some other requirements, the need for rigorous assessment of the number of stair cores and a commitment that the development won't include combustible materials in its external walls. A completely different topic, we're engaging on draft guidance covering co-living schemes, or as we in the London plan team like to confusingly refer to them as, large-scale purpose-built shared <laughs> living. <laughs> I can't claim any idea. Uh, quite a mouthful. Anyway, we're uh, engaging on this guidance at the moment, and it sets out numerical requirements for co-living schemes, five square meters of communal indoor space, one square meter of outdoor space per resident, and it sets out what's included in that and what isn't. And it also has requirements for 10% of uh, units to be accessible. Guidance also requires a management plan covering various aspects of how the development will operate. I press the wrong button entirely. So uh, in the coming weeks, we hope to adopt another couple of bits of guidance on circular economy statements and whole life cycle carbon. These are going to help to ensure that the larger schemes, those that are referable to the mayor, are designed in ways that minimize embodied carbon and reduce the production of waste materials from the construction industry. Following the local elections, we're gonna be developing further guidance on a whole range of topics, affordable housing and viability, industry and logistics. Um, and I'm sure we'll be picking up on the work of the Centre for London 
uh, that uh, Nico was talking about earlier. Social infrastructure, accessibility, equality, inclusion, and diversity. And we've got various other bits of guidance that are mulling around in the background that we'll uh, begin giving some consideration to. Alongside all of this, the team have been developing our monitoring platforms uh, so that we can see what's coming forward and where. This is a screen grab from our Planning London data hub uh, showing residential completions in the London Borough of Brent. Um, and I think it, so it allows users to develop your own dashboards, reports, and download data as well. And we've just launched brand new pages that monitor the delivery in each opportunity area. But we know that producing a London plan takes quite a bit of time. Last year, we had to do a full plan. It took us four and a half years. So we started work on the imaginatively named Planning for London program, an opportunity for us to begin the conversation that will inform the next iteration of the London plan. We're gathering evidence, we're capturing people's views, and we're identifying the issues and options that will then uh, be taken forward. I encourage you to have a look at that link. The current stage of this is to get views of Londoners through the GLA's Talk London platform, which has over 60,000 users. And we want to understand what they think of the key challenges, uh, the recent things they've experienced, like how working from home might change their area. We're also very fortunate to be surrounded by expertise at the GLA, not least the aptly named GLA intelligence team, uh, and they've been closely monitoring and researching London's population change over the past couple of years. This helps us to begin understanding likely trajectories and trends, and then we'll use that to inform our own evidence base, which we'll be commissioning over the coming months. This is uh, just one snippet from a report that they published, uh, I think in February, looking at some of the, some of the trends that we've had in terms of uh, population change over recent years, much more information and data available on our website. But finally, I'd just like to return to my theme of certainty. And one of the key benefits, I think, of having a clear policy approach is that people know what they're aiming for. And it seems to work. <laughs> With the introduction of the threshold approach in the London plan for affordable housing, we've seen a pretty dramatic increase in the average number of affordable homes by scheme on referable applications. Instead of languishing in the low 20s, we increased the percentage to 39% in 2019, and that figure's actually increased over the past couple of years as well. This is what the London plan does best, setting a clear aspiration backed by political will and implemented through partnership with boroughs, with the development industry, and with Londoners. A few ways you can find about, out more about our London Plan Guidance Programme, and I'd, I'd encourage everybody to sign up to our newsletter. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Well, that was very concise, thank you. Uh, Rob, uh, any questions for Rob before we wind up? Yes. Andrew, Andy. Hello, uh, Andrew Cato, uh, President of the ACA. So, um, well, Andrew Brown on that part. Um, my question is a London plan, like so many others, it seems to me, is expanding all the time into areas that perhaps should not be planning. Um, the ACA planning manifesto. Um, suggests, and I think I'd like your response on this, that matters that should be in building control have been creeping into planning far too much. Um, sometimes to the good, I'll, I'll say, uh, the current nationally, uh, national space standards started in the last London plan, um, crept sideways and in various directions and are now national, but as a result, why are they still in local plans? Um, you were, you've just mentioned fire safety. This is a technical matter. All buildings should be fire safe, no matter what the planning gain for their construction or the rest. Why is it a planning matter? Because um, GLA put it in the London plan. We took four major schemes. You wanted a statement. Within a, two months, every local authority I know wants a fire statement as a validation requirement on every application. I spent my 
last half hour this morning before leaving to come here, writing one for a single story house extension. That is a nonsense. It is adding to the workload of the under-resourced planners. Why? Good question. Um, there's a few answers on that. One is, to be blunt, politics. Um, I think, uh, you know, the mayor has made various commitments uh, to do things about important matters like fire safety. Um, it's his view that uh, the government's building regulation system for fire safety is simply not up to scratch. Uh, and, you know, therefore the planning system needs to do something about that. What we've tried to do, uh, I think we recognise, you know, what we don't want is a system that grinds to a halt because of all of the, the requirements. The London Plan guidance on fire safety makes it clear that there are uh, reasonable exceptions that can be made for various schemes. Uh, we've spelt out the sort of different schemes that can go down a reasonable exceptions route in order to not have to submit the kind of full, you know, bells and whistles fire safety statement that you might expect for a larger scheme. So we're taking that sort of approach on board. I think though, there are some things like space standards where uh, it, it's quite right and proper that the planning system uh, has uh, a, a role to play in that. Uh, and the other one I've mentioned is environmental standards as well. Now that's an area where uh, we saw the government significantly step back uh, and reduce the kind of requirements for uh, high performing sustainable buildings, uh, you know, with the coalition government. Uh, I think it's right and proper that where a planning system can, and the London planning system I think can, uh, incorporate high standards of sustainability without it preventing unviable, without it creating unviable schemes, that we need to be doing things like that so that we are creating sustainable development. So I think I take the point, but I don't think it's necessarily the case that the London plan has created a whole raft of additional requirements that are unexpected. Um, and I think I would say finally that we did acknowledge this. So when we went through the London plan examination in public, we made it quite clear. Yeah, we do expect the development industry to do more and we expect the private, uh, the public, the public sector to also do more. Um, and that was a clear political steer that all of us need to do better at getting, uh, getting the planning system right. I think I take that point, but I, I, I do believe that what's happening in London in particular is that because uh, London is a, you know, there's a two-tier process here, the local authority, the, the, the boroughs, are saying, well, we'd better make sure this happens, so everything has to be proven on every application. And as we've just heard, you know, the planning system is grinding to a halt because no one's paying for it. Yes, I mean, it's, it's been a planning in London editorial line for a long time that it's no use talking and moaning about the planning management system and plan making systems being under resourced when the government at the same time keeps loading more and more and more things for them to do. And the seed we're standing in a firm of lawyers, judicial review has got a lot to answer for. When I and the for the ACA was consulted about the Arabs uh, uh, change from the old TP1 application form and added reams and reams of pieces of information in great lists, the civil servants at the department said, well, you know, they'll use their discretion. And we said, no, they won't. They'll think of judicial review. And if they haven't asked for every damn thing on the list, then they'll be feel vulnerable. Are you monitoring it? Oh no, we don't have the resources to monitor it. <laughs> well, I was on the steering group of two, me and Mike Kiley, um, at the department three or four years later when the, the Killian Pretty review took place to try and, as I rather rudely said to the same Ar Arupian consultants, I said, well, you created the train crash and now we're here to count the bodies. Uh, but we're still stuck with that same mentality, lists and lists of information and a legal backed system, which is scared of saying, using its discretion or what is proportionate to use a recently well used word. Anyway, thank you. That's another conference, um, which we're not <laughs> gonna have today because the wine awaits. I'm going to invite Paul, to give us his brilliant wind up. Um, I haven't introduced Paul for failing earlier. 
Paul uh, is the most distinguished journalist in our uh, architecture industry, if we can call it that. He's edited everything, BD, AJ, AR, was editorial director of the last two. Uh, more importantly, he edited Varsity when he was in Cambridge and so on, right? And of course, he's a partner uh, with me and Lee Mallet. Uh, Brian, thank you very much. You've been a very patient audience. I'll keep this brief and I'll try to be as cynical and objectionable as possible. <laughs> I mean, in a, in a nice sort of way, because of course, um, when you come to these things, first, very stimulating afternoon, lots of information as, as, as well as ideas uh, and commentary. Uh, and the uh, first thing, which sort of explains my question to you, Jess, about the North, because uh, the first thing I thought was interesting about the Leveling Up White Paper, in the introduction, Michael Gove says, you know, in almost a second sentence, the BBC is the greatest broadcasting organisation in the world. And I thought, well, what's that got to do with levelling it up? And I thought, actually, <laughs> there's a man with his eye on the top job, uh, especially given his boss's aversion uh, to the uh, Boris bashing uh, corporation. And then thinking about the North, I, I realised that there, there's a sort of, um, well, it's not an elephant in the room. It's the sort of, uh, it's, the, it's the dog that didn't bark. Uh, it's um, this, do you remember that thing called class where people used to think that actually deprivation and inequality had something to do with class conditions? And what we've now done is substituted geography. <laughs> so, you know, the Bank of England can chug up north on the Stockton and Darlington line and pretend that they're bringing enlightenment to those poor people for whom planning exists. It's what middle-class people to do poorer people in other parts uh, of the country, like piping Beethoven down the pits. Uh, meanwhile, of course, we don't notice that there are parts of the North that are extremely prosperous. I mean, if you want to go to Cheshire, um, and see a lot of extremely wealthy, extremely rich people living in much greater amenity than most people in the southeast because the homes are cheaper, the gardens are larger, and actually the Italian restaurants aren't too bad as well, apart from all those footballers and their wags who'll be occupying uh, the private room. So the thing about the Bank of England, of course, they well know that wealth creation, which is what will make the real difference about levelling up, uh, is fractal and chaotic. Uh, it is not in the nice, nicely, nicely 1947 view of the world, which is only if you write it all down and produce a taxonomy uh, that somehow the world will become better. And I have to laugh when I think about the London plan. It's a bit like Stalin's target for wheat production in the 1930s. The more you miss, the more you miss the delivery, the more I'll increase your target numbers. I'm doing my job, why aren't you people doing yours? And all those figures are a kind of fantasy compared with uh, three or four decades of non-construction. I mean, how are we gonna make up for the fact that the population of London, so almost secretly you would think in policy terms, I mean, it went up two million. Uh, where were the housing for the extra two million, by the way? Absolutely non-existent. Local authorities weren't building any. Um, there was no leadership for periods of that um, in central London. And Margaret Thatcher, much reviled by everyone. Of course, one of the reasons that uh, she is reviled by Tories, who essentially, let's be frank, dislike most of the working class, other than the sort of Alf Garnets who vote for them, and Labour for a long period of time, and just embarrassed by them. You know, Peter Mandelson saying he's very relaxed about the filthy rich no doubt including some of his Russian pals. So you had a political class that didn't really care, especially in London, whether we built enough homes or whether we didn't, because the majority of people, like me, the lucky boomer generation, who bought in at what now seem grotesquely, absurdly low prices, were doing okay. So let's hear it for the Daily Mail vote and see what happens. And Labour would know better than the Tories. Of course, the thing is, Margaret Thatcher, um, having had the little warm up from Edward Heath, who gave working class people the biggest pay rise they ever had in their lives, for those of you who remember pay restraint, it was one pound plus four percent. The poorest people in society got a bigger pay rise than anybody else 
And a lot, of course, Conservatives hated that, just as they hated Peter Walker, first Secretary of State for the Environment, now the Department of Leveling Up, Housing and Communities, who suggested that any council tenant who'd lived in their home for 40 years should be given it for nothing. Can you imagine the screams of horror from the Conservative Party who viewed all council house occupants uh, as idle kind of leeches on the state, even though at that time, most of them were in employment, paid their rent and paid their rates. Not true today for other reasons. And of course, what Margaret Thatcher did, uh, she created a massive wealth transfer to ordinary working class council tenants, many of whom had lived in their homes for decades. And if there's one thing that at least my socialist labor voting pals hate is the idea of poor people getting any money from anyone and being made kind of equivalent to them. So all of a sudden, all these poor working class people, hey, they're homeowners, that can't be right. It's a kind of weird thing in Britain. It's a sort of cognitive dissonance. We love the idea that you know we can become homeowners, as government policy now says, let's have more homeowners. But on the other hand, we don't actually want anybody having a house transfer to them that they've been paying for for a long time. And I think the question arises, implicit in all this is the funding for housing, which of course can come from LNG and pension funds. Why is it gonna come from developers? We've got walls of money in this city affecting this country. And the only question is, how do you unlock it in an intelligent and rational way, instead of as Mayor Livingston did, as Boris tried to wriggle out from, and as Sadiq Khan has brought back with a vengeance, giving punishment beatings to house builders, the only actual people who are actually building anything in quantity for that extra two million population. And by the way, predicted the London plan to go up by another million in the next, what, 10 years or something like that. So, you know, this level of housing we're providing, frankly, is a joke, worthy it may be, welcome to the reintroduction of local authorities and housing provision. I was brought up in Churchill Gardens in Pimlico in an era when conservative councils believed that they had a duty to all their citizens and all their populations and not the ones who are kind of faggot of a charity, a charity operation, uh, an arm's length thing, you know, doing three flats and a kennel in Church Street and pretending it's all marvellous. Well, I mustn't go on too long, but I just wanted to say one other thing about the, uh, the, the, the London plan in relation to Greenbelt. Now, why can't Greenbelt be like listed buildings? Why can't you have grade one, you can't touch it? Grade two start, you virtually can never touch it. And grade two, let's have a discussion. And of course, that's because mayors um, and politicians in an age of transitioning, ladies and gentlemen, or perhaps I should say gentlefolk, um, are addicted to the binary. If we can have a design code where it's a yes or a no, why have a messy thing called guidance where you can have a conversation? Uh, let's be rigid and Stalinist about this. You can't do this, you can't do that. And therefore you have to rely on consultants like Chris Francis to actually win two planning appeals on metropolitan open land for much needed housing schemes in the London borough of Bromley, uh, with costs awarded in favour of his client first time round, had to be shared out second time round. It is possible and it is rational, but not if we keep going down on this path of, you know, um, two legs good, four legs bad, whatever, whatever it is. Um, that, that's the way not of resolution, uh, but uh, of uh, conflict. To end on a more positive note, I think some of the speakers this afternoon have actually shown, Robert Adam included, that you don't have to be binary about this. I mean, when Robert said, well, you know, beauty is a really difficult thing, I'm glad he said that because, you know, this thing about beauty is, is, is very philosophical and it's very dangerous territory because if you buy into the sort of Keatsian beauty is truth and truth beauty, Sounds great, doesn't it? How lovely. Oh, it's honest, it's beautiful. There's some little street committee with Nicholas Boy Smith saying, that's appropriate for your area. And you say, well, hang on a moment. Who are the people who said that? What about Bob Adams' kids who completely disagree with him about what's beautiful? Which one's going to win? Um, is it gonna be a political decision? 
Or is it going to be Nicholas Boy Smith, who, as far as I know, hasn't been elected to anything except in his own mind? I mean, where's the democratic process in all this? We can have little street Soviets, but, you know, is, is, that, is that so uh, brilliant? I want to end with this. Mark Cousins, the late Mark Cousins, great teacher at the Architectural Association, in a series of lectures on ugliness. Have you noticed that thing? You know, that mendacious statement about um, that the, the, the changes to MPPF uh, mean that local authorities will now be able to reject things um, because they're ugly. Well, the first version of the MPPF says that planners can reject things that are not sufficient quality. Why introduce the ugly word? Because the problem with ugly, as Mark Cousins pointed out, in medieval Europe, you identify a woman as ugly, she's a witch. And what do you do with witches? And it doesn't take too long. You start going down that line, I'll tell you what's beautiful and true. And I'll also tell you what's ugly and unacceptable. And the next thing, you will have commissars telling you, we're gonna knock down every brutalist building. And all the buildings that English Heritage now lists, which they would oppose were they planning applications today, are not only a denial of history, but they're a denial of the optimistic future in which we can only speculate about what things may become and become in a very marvellous, but as yet unknowable way. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, forces me to mention my personal planning guru, a uh, chap called Spike Milligan. Mm -hmm. uh, he famously said, if you have no plan, then nothing can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> On which point note, I will tell you that we do have a plan and it's a bar at the back. Thank you very much. Just, sorry, can I see the thank you? Oh, yes. We're going to have another thank you. Um, so I'm Roddy Houston. I'm former president of the Cambridge Land Society. Uh, Ian Marcus, the current president, sends his apologies. Um, he's only doing about 14 or 15 jobs at the moment, not including his presidency. So he had to go to another board meeting. So I hope you'll forgive him for that. So Cambridge Land Society, out of a quick show of hands, how many of you are members? Excellent, reasonable smash rate. How many of you are alumni of the University of Cambridge, but not yet a member? Oh, need to join. Um, how many uh, students have we got here from the University of Cambridge? A couple? Five? Excellent. Thank you. Very warm welcome to you. So Cambridge Land Society, what do we do? We do events like this, continuous professional development, thought leadership and networking events uh, for alumni from the University of Cambridge. If you haven't managed to get your way there yet, it's never too late. I encourage you to apply. You've just got to be brilliant, work very hard and be lucky. So what could go wrong there? Um, events on the back of your then give a hint of some of the things that are coming up and I've been asked to highlight a couple um, emerging fund managers panel discussion oh my god I wish I'd bought industrial land in London two and a half million an acre of only five years ago and now over seven million that sounds good it's that one Damn. Um, so that'll be an interesting one uh, we have the Silver Street group annual dinner 19th of May Silver Street group is for our younger members, people who have graduated in the last 10 years, under 35, so students particularly spread the word, come along to that and uh, join that if you'd like to. Um, it's not actually on the list, but we have, uh, we're just finalizing the date, is Ali here? Um, I think we're aiming for the middle of June to go and see Plumtree Court, which is um, building dear to my heart. I worked in it for a while when I was at Cooper's, now Goldman Sachs headquarters for London and Europe. So there you are, the sucking vampire squid of capitalism. Um, what a place to go and see. And then uh, in October, the annual careers in real estate fair. And I think it was um, Roy made the point, how do we attract more young people into the planning profession? So we've changed the name of the careers fair. It's been going for many, many years. Is Victoria still here? Can't see Victoria. I think Victoria's left. So uh, Victoria Collett was our honorary careers officer, but I think we've been running careers for at least 30 years. We're now changing the name and including uh, deliberately planning in the environment to encourage more of you. So if you're interested in coming to recruit Cambridge students and you're in the planning business, you're in the environmental business, the advisory business, please do come. We'd love you to do that. Ali will have all the details if you'd like to come to that. Um, 
before I get to the thank yous, and, and uh, I can't possibly follow Paul's tour de force, but I thought there are some, some quick takeaways. And I mean, it seems obvious, but planning matters. Clearly it matters. Leveling up matters. So what's my day job? My day job, I'm Deputy Director of London Government Property Agency. My day job is to close civil service buildings in London to drive the civil service north. And our target is to do at least 22,000. We've had talk about Stanley's targets. Um, yep, that was uh, set by Muggins here. Reason was our government told us they only wanted 20 office buildings in central London, which is odd, you know, because we had about 80 or 90. And we said, okay, which 20? We decided which 20. We decided on the population that was in them and we decided what was in the rest. A minus B equals 22,000. So that's the target we've been set. Um, and various departments are being encouraged to move. Why? Because Brexit sent a shockwave through the UK political system demonstrated that the wealth in the southeast in London had not trickled down, had not gone north. There is a huge gap, despite the hot spots of Cheshire and the WAG's favourite restaurants in certain lovely little villages in the northwest, that there is a very real problem in Britain. Britain is broken. Be under no illusion that that is what Brexit represents. It represented a protest vote against the metropolitan elite, a total hatred of the likes of Paul Mandelson in certain communities and Jeremy Corbyn. And those people ended up voting conservative. People whose families had never voted conservative in generations. That's why leveling up matters. Britain is broken. If you go to some parts of the north, you go to some of the cities, we are uh, talking recently to, as she was now retired, but Sir John Manzoni, the chief executive of the civil service, went to a conference in Blackpool. I've never been to Blackpool, it's not my kind of place, but most of you will know it. A wonderful seascape with all these wonderful uh, entertainments on the beach and a whole community around that. There are people who live in Blackpool, which is not a small place, not a big place, who have never been to the beach. They only live a few hundred yards from it, They've never even been to the beach. How can that be possible? There are areas of deprivation in our country that we simply do not understand. So that is why the civil service has been encouraged to move policy roles to the regions, to make Her Majesty's government more connected to the other parts of the UK and to change the bias, to change the way. How do we get more economic growth into areas which have seen substandard economic growth for generations. It's been tried before, whether this one will succeed or not, but making a ministry and deciding to call it levelling up is a start. So that's the political bit. Um, Napoleon called us a nation of shopkeepers. Is retail dead from the sounds of things? Maybe not quite, but retail is clearly not the answer. And uh, forget green belt appeals, you need to work with the local planners to get into that. So fascinating afternoon with a wonderful range of speakers. I'd like to thank all of our speakers. I'd like to thank Ali for helping arrange this, Brian and the um, snappily titled Architectural Planning Engineering Construction Forum of the Cambridge University Land Society, which I encouraged Brian to set up when I was president for arranging this. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Dentons for hosting us. And I'd particularly like to thank the students and most of all you for the audience. I hope you've got as much out of the as I have, even though it's not my core business. Um, what a fascinating afternoon. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dentons. Thank you, our speakers. And thank you for coming. Okay, so institutional building. Yeah, yeah, so you will enter they will open. We couldn't front line operations, like courts, tribunals, schools. This doesn't make sense. Defense.